So this is Kentio, and she's the mother of one of the leaders here in the Ochum Church. Um, and uh, I'm just going to interview her and ask her a few questions. Uh, 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 so she's, she's been a believer now for uh, 13 years. But how get do it? So she's a budget. She would say budget. ดอร์อาเชอร์ดอร์อาเชอร์กระไดไอเชอร์ดาอดงกันงานกระไดเมมาชายดาไอเมมาชายดาไอเอ่อมาเรียนเอ่อเชอร์กระไดฮับบิก
It starts with your person you work with. And so I want to challenge you with some simple, just heart points that are throughout Scripture. These are big ideas. These aren't little fine print. These are big ideas. The first one is this. Why do we love? Because we're loved. God had this beautiful plan in the garden to love his creation. Sin entered the world. We've talked about this. And guess what? He continued to love us because he said, I desire that relationship so much, I'm going to do something really powerful for you. And look at this, what it says in 1 John. We love because he first loved us. Why, do, why am I compelled to love? Because of that statement right there, because he first loved me. And he began to transform me. And it says, whoever claims to love God and yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. Ah, that's kind of sharp. Hold off. Are you sure I'm a liar? He says, yeah, because if you love me, you're going to love your brother and sister. And for some of you who are new to that idea, that's not talking specific to your uh, family member, blood relative. That's referring to all of God's creation. All the men and women on this planet, your brothers, your sisters. And then you get specific to the church, your brother and sister in Christ. And then, of course, your blood relative. But then he says this, for whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. So why do we love? Because we're loved. And because we are loved, we love. Because we're loved, we love. When it finally permeates deep into your heart how much love God has poured out on you, that he would leave heaven and enter his creation as Jesus and die for you, when that permeates so deep that you just can't even wrestle without thinking, wow, why would he do this? Then you start to love and you go, I have to share it. I can't stay the same. I'm compelled by this. And the second thing we start to look at then why do we give? Because I love, right? Why do we give? Because he has given. It says here that he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us. That's a pretty generous offering that you would lay down your life for your friend. Lay down your life for a creation. It says, how will he not also along with him graciously give all things? If God won't withhold himself, what more does he want to pour out on you. If God won't withhold himself, how much does he want you to pour out for others? See, this idea is this, that we give because he is given. And look what it says, he did not spare his own son. That is a massive sacrifice, would you agree? That is a lot of giving. And so because of that, we give. And I want to challenge you for a moment. I want you to think, how is your giving? First, I challenged you with your loving. Are you loving people? Are you loving those that you don't like? Are you loving those that you don't understand? Are you loving those that you don't know? And we talk about Cambodia. We're going to really focus on that here in a minute. And you may never meet well, you will meet a Cambodian today, but you may never meet a Kroon believer, but can you love them? And how's your giving then? We, we say that. How's your time? Are you willing to give your time? Sometimes time comes in the form of serving. That's me giving. Sometimes it comes in my willingness to invest time to learn about a people group that needs Christ and time to set aside to pray for those people and those missionaries. How's your giving? And of course, there is a need. Finances are necessary to continue advancing the gospel. We can donate our time and we can donate all these gifts that God has given us, but there is a financial need. So how's your giving? Are you invested in the kingdom of God? Is that really evident in your treasure of your heart? So I'm going to continue. We're going to come back to this, but first I want to challenge you. How's your loving and how's your giving? We love because we're loved. We give because he gave to us. Something cool happened here at Family Church. And for those who aren't really maybe caught up to this, because this has been going on for a while, I want to make sure that we're about to step into a cool opportunity to hear what is happening through Family
Family Church as we give and love, through the missionaries as they serve and give and love. And we're going to hear this, but back in 2006, some of you in this room signed this document. This was a big banner. And we had this thing that God was doing. We started to see missions in a little different light. Instead of just having a missionary who we say, oh, man, this person, we're so proud, and they're going to go serve, and we're going to not only pray for them and invest in them, and those are good things, and we're not stopping that. But God said, I'd like you to have a, a, a little different picture. I'd like you to think about adopting a people group. And that's the wording we started to use. This people group idea, a group of people who have a very unique language and ethnic identity that is not defined by a government line, but but by a God-given boundary that says these are unique people. And so what we did is, as a church, we prayed and we began to seek, and God led us to connect in Cambodia with Craig and Jenny Mallow and several others, and we adopted a people group. And I want you to understand what that means in this context. It means that when any of the missionaries go away from that people group, we are committed to that people group. That we don't follow the missionary, we follow the people group. And we're committed, Family Church, to see that group reached. That they will have enough believers who are advancing the gospel, spreading the word in their communities, and reaching other unreached people groups. That's what it means. And I'm excited about what I'm going to share with you. So I'm going to invite Craig Mallow up, and he's going to get a chance to come and share with us a little bit. And uh, as you get to, to hear from Craig, you're going to hear years of experience. It's pretty cool. So come on up. Let's give him a hand as he comes up and joins us. <laughs> Hi, Craig. <laughs> Did you get your mic on? Can you turn that on for me? Make sure we're good. Yeah, so this is Craig. He's married to Jenny. I'm Craig. I'm married to a Jenny also. Um, so it's just a unique thing that we share in common. And it goes weirder from there. So here we are. So, yeah. so Craig, tell us a little bit. Like, uh, here's your wife, Jenny, on the screen there. Um, tell us a little bit about how did you end up in Cambodia? Uh, that's not necessarily the, the first destination a lot of people think of. So what did God do in your life? Yeah, so I, I, uh, I was in dental school, actually, when the Lord kind of worked in my heart and wanted me. Uh, I felt like the Lord was calling me to become a missionary, go long-term overseas. And at the time, I couldn't have told you if Cambodia was in Africa or Asia, actually. I <laughs> uh, knew very little about it. Uh, but I had an opportunity. Um, I took a class called Perspectives, which um, some of you may have actually heard of or taken. It's a missions class. And it, it really touched my heart because it talked about unreached people groups. And an unreached people group is, uh, you know, probably Matthew 28, 19. You know, it says to go and make disciples of all nations. And so the Bible actually tells us, you know, we're supposed to be a part of reaching every ethnic group. That word nations there actually isn't talking about government-type nations. It's talking about ethnicities or language groups, you know, ethnic groups. It comes from that word in the Greek. But um, in that class, I, I got a burden for that. And I wanted to go to some, some group in the world that didn't have any knowledge of God, that never had a, any church or any, um, that hadn't received the gospel yet. And so I learned about an opportunity to go to Thailand and work in the Cambodian refugee camps in 1989. Mm. And I worked in those camps, and I learned about, I saw refugees coming out of Cambodia um, who had no knowledge of God at all and were without hope. They'd gone through a genocidal regime where millions of people were killed, and uh, they needed dentists to go into Cambodia. And so the Lord used that then to direct, to direct me to Cambodia, um, and I ended up uh, going there a few years later and in the meantime, then, I went back to my church in Chicago, and our church actually had a Cambodian congregation meeting in it, um, and I went to the English-speaking church because, you know, why would I go to the Cambodian church, right? And uh, <laughs> when I came back, though, I had a, a burden for Cambodia, and I started going to the Cambodian church, and that's where I met Jenny. Then she had come to the U.S. about 10 years earlier as a refugee, and had out of that genocidal regime, and had lost her father and a sister, and... Um, had been become a Christian through that, as many Cambodians who came to the U.S. did. And uh, sh I shared with her where I was headed, and, and uh, we both prayed about it. And the Lord actually did something she never expected, and that was to go back to Cambodia, the place that she had run from 10 years earlier. Um, so we were married, and then about a year later went to Cambodia. It must have been really difficult for Jenny to have to go back into 
an area that she fled for her life, basically. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. It was completely unexpected, and, and I think the Lord had to do uh, a yeah. special work in her heart. Uh, yeah, for sure. She had a lot of uh, a fear and, and uh, bitterness there. So what, yeah. is, what is life like then uh, for a Cambodian? Prior, they don't, have, they don't have any knowledge of God or Jesus or salvation. What is that like? Yeah. So people in Cambodia, as you may know, Cambodia is a Buddhist country, or, or there are also some Muslims and some animists. Um, the area we work in is, is in the northeast, and uh, it's a hill tribe area. So most of those people are what they call animists, and animists are people who worship the spirits. Um, they, they have no knowledge of a creator, almighty, loving God, uh, at all. Um, and so I would say life for them is without hope and that it's full of fear. Um, it's full of fear of the spirits. Um, you see in this uh, picture right here, uh, a buffalo sacrifice. And so uh, the Krung people are, uh, whenever someone gets sick, they will worship, an, uh, sorry, they will sacrifice an animal to worship the spirits uh, because they believe all sickness comes from the spirits. Uh, they don't go to the doctor or the hospital traditionally at all. Um, so they live in that constant fear, and whenever there's a, a problem, like in their, their crops are failing, they'll, they'll sacrifice animals. And that causes, um, it impoverishes them, because often, you know, they don't get well. And so they'll start off sacrificing their, all their chickens, and then they'll sacrifice their pigs, and then eventually they work up to their water buffaloes, and that's, that's like their life savings right there. Um, and so it also uh, drives them to hopelessness, because they, they run out of finances. Um, there's a, also a bondage, I would say, to sin, and um, they have all sorts of, uh, uh, along with the animal sacrifice goes drunkenness. This is actually a, a Krung moonshine, but it's homemade uh, whiskey that they make, and they will, everyone in the village will get drunk when they have one of these sacrifices, sometimes for two or three days at a time. And so alcoholism is a big problem among the Krung as well. Um, suicide rates uh, are very high uh, in our Krung village, in about four or five years that we were living there, had, I think, three suicides in that village. Um, so there's a lot of, of uh, problems, and it comes from that hopelessness and that bondage to sin that they live with. Yeah. Even uh, Cantillo, right, in that video, she mentioned yeah. s some of her children died for that very reason. She was unwilling That's and right. scared. That's right. right. Uh, I've, I've seen uh, mothers with children that could probably have their lives saved by going to the hospital that would refuse to, to give them up to uh, help because they're living in fear, living in mm. fear of the spirits, and that's, that's all they can think about. So they um, live in fear. They live mm -hmm. under this rule of a spirit that doesn't help them, and they're sure something will work. It doesn't work, so it's mm -hmm. this hopeless cycle that goes on. Mm -hmm. But you come, we begin to do Bible translation. Mm -hmm. The church begins to, to grow. And so what, what's going on now? Yeah kind of in, in Cambodia, in this part of the world? What's going on in Ratanakiri? So it's been actually a, a real blessing. We've been in Cambodia since 91, and in, in those, when we first came to Cambodia, there were about 1,000 believers. Um, some of, there were more believers than that before the genocidal regime, so many of them died or left the country. But out of that 1,000 believers then, over a period of maybe 25 years, we've seen a very slow but gradual growth of people coming to Christ. And now there's maybe 300,000 Christians in the country. Um, cool. So a really uh, amazing thing. And up in the Northeast, too, uh, when we first went there in the Northeast, there was uh, no believers. I can remember going around the province, and um, actually I started off asking if there were any Christians, and nobody knew what that was. So then I said, has anybody ever heard of Jesus? And nobody ever heard that word before. Um, so it was just a really unreached place. And now, it, now there are thou, several thousand believers there among the Krung, uh, perhaps 500. Um, and so their lives have really been transformed. And you saw uh, Kentil give her testimony there. Um, and she's just one example of, of many Krung that have had their lives touched. And you all uh, here at Family Church have had a part of that uh, through your prayers and through your giving. Um, you've helped to, to see that happen. Um, so I hope and what's that you going feel on that. in that picture? That was January, so, so give them a little... That was a Christmas celebration at a Krung village when you all were visiting us last January. Yep. And uh, yeah, so uh, rather than these times of drunkenness and animal sacrifice and people in fear and mistrust, it's a much more wholesome time where they were able to have a big meal together and uh, there was a Christmas story was told and they were worshiping um, in, uh, in Krung language. 
One of the things that's uh, happened now is that there are about 180 songs in their own traditional music as well, and in their language that they have, they've taken traditional melodies that they already had and written Christian words to them, and they play their traditional songs as well. Um, this is the Kroeng Songbook. So there's yeah, about 180 uh, songs in this book um, that uh, has just been, this was just printed uh, last year. Um, and so they were singing those songs at that gathering there uh, last Christmas. Um, and so, yeah, it's a really uh, a changed time. That's the church building that they built uh, right next to it. Uh, tell, tell a little bit, too, I guess, as the, ch as the church begins to have an impact. There was recently a funeral. Yeah. Give us a little story. What was that? Kind of what happened in yeah. that? Yeah, so, so I mentioned the, the fear and the hopelessness. Uh, when, when a traditional funeral happens, uh, they're, they're worried about two things. One is they don't really have an understanding of what happens after death. Uh, they don't really have an idea about that. And so they'll bury people with their possessions, um, everything from their clothing to nowadays their cell phone or something, um, <laughs> hoping that they'll be able to take that with them to wherever it is that they go when they die. Um, the other thing that they're concerned about is that person's spirit because they believe that uh, spirits can haunt them after the person dies. And so they go through a lot of rituals and the way that they have to bury them and things they have to do with the body to make sure that that, bo that spirit doesn't come back particularly if they have had some kind of an argument or have had some um, problems with that person. You know, that person might come back and cause harm to them. Um, and so now, um, you know, the Christian funerals, of course, are, are very, very different. You know, they're not full of, of fear and of, of all those concerns. Instead, they're more of a celebration that now we know this person has gone to a much, much happier place. And um, recently, there was uh, just a story, too, of, of the church and the hope that the church is bringing, I think, um, they're in Ochum, uh, where we lived for several years. There's an older couple in their probably late 70s, and very, very poor. Um, they uh, just barely had enough to survive, and the wife had a stroke and was paralyzed. And so this older man then became the full-time caregiver in his little hut of a woman who couldn't feed herself, couldn't go to the bathroom, um, completely on him to take care of her. Um, and they didn't have enough to eat. So the church started reaching out to them, and the missionaries as well, uh, re bringing them food, bringing them water, and helping them just get their basic needs met, um, just praying for them, sharing the gospel with them, giving um, an audio Bible to them on an MP3 player because they couldn't read, and read the Bible, but they could listen to it. And uh, the husband has gradually uh, made a commitment to the Lord, and eventually his wife did too. And then recently she passed away just uh, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And so I was watching on Facebook, actually, some of my Cambodian friends posted a video of the funeral. And it was just wonderful to see how the church um, stepped in and provided a Christian funeral so they didn't have all the animistic worship to the spirits. Um, and even the daughter of the woman who's not a Christian and who's actually quite, she's basically waiting for her mother to die so she could uh, have the land um, she uh, came to the funeral, and um, she's not a Christian, but I think she's, she's seeing all that, and we're waiting to see what's going to happen, that maybe she'll come to the Lord, too. And I think you said that that's not normal. People in the villages, they didn't, nobody else no stepped in. No one else in. in the entire village uh, okay. did anything to, to help that so family at all. The church yeah. began to show what, what love is, right? Yes, that's right. And so it's they, often the case they don't uh, step out to care for others or to help others. Yeah. So like we started, they're bringing yeah. love and they're going to their neighbor and they're caring yeah. for them. It's a big that's deal. Right. And that yeah. picture there, if you want to point to that, is yeah. um, what kind of a special thing in that picture. Uh, maybe explain that's inside the Ochum Church. Mm -hmm. But talk about what's kind of unique about that. So uh, you'll see, I don't know if you can see that well, but there are what we call some gongs, some large round metal gongs that are laying on that table in a circle. And uh, so when the, when the Kruang people started uh, worshiping in their own language, then that, that's one of the traditional instruments that they used to use when they would uh, worship the spirits or have one of their animal sacrifices, is they would always play the gongs. And uh, we actually encouraged them from the very beginning to use their traditional instruments to worship God. Um, and it was hard, actually, in the beginning. They didn't really want to try that uh, mm. because they, they felt like it was, it was for the spirits. You know, they couldn't think of using that for God. But then uh, one day there was kind of a breakthrough, and they started being open to that and using their, their gongs. And now they wouldn't worship without them. That's their, <laughs> their main way of worshiping on a Sunday now is playing the gongs and their, uh, their traditional music. So big transformation of even how they worshiped. And so yeah. we have one last one I'd love for you to share a little bit about. So tell us about 
the radio ministry. Yeah. So there are uh, many things that we can celebrate that I could share about uh, Bible schools uh, that we have going on. Uh, we have uh, the, the Bible been translated. Uh, this is the New Testament in Krung, which is basically finished. I mean, they're using it now. There's a few final checks that still need to be done with the translators. The uh, uh, Bible is there now. Um, and then one of the things that we've done, though, for those who can't read is, is start a radio broadcast. And you all have actually been supporting that financially as well, and we want to thank you for that. Um, and just recently, so it's a, it's a one and a half hour broadcast on primetime radio at seven in the evening every night on an FM station. We buy time. Um, and recently, they, the, the group that makes the recordings, we have four languages, so there's four part-time staff, one for Kruung, one for Tabuan, one for Dry, one for Khmer, the four languages in our province. And um, there's four staff that work part-time to do the recordings of Bible reading, of Bible teaching, of worship songs, and of some health and educational messages. Um, they were moving from place to place. We didn't really have a stable place for them to work. And recently, we decided we needed to build them a building. And so that's the construction that this picture was just taken last week. And uh, again, uh, Sutherland uh, uh, Family Church helped to give offering to uh, build this building. The land was donated, and we just needed uh, about $8,000 for a building. And you all uh, gave significantly towards that. I believe you had a vacation Bible school. So some of the kids here actually helped uh, to put that building up. And that'll be a, it's a three-room building where they'll be recording uh, Christian Krung uh, messages that will be disseminated both with FM radio, but also with uh, memory cards and MP3 players and telephones, uh, cell phones that people can listen to them on. Um, so a lot of technology being used now as well. Yeah, so for those yeah. watching in green, thank you, because your VBX and the Sutherland VBX, they raised uh, almost $800 just there to go toward the building project, and then other people have invested in that. So really appreciate it. You know, thank yeah. you so much for Thanks. all the updates, Craig. Really appreciate it. Yeah. I know there's more, and if you're watching in green or online, if you want to come tomorrow to the baptism, Craig and Jenny will both be there, and you can visit with them there if you'd we'd, like. We'd so. love, to, love to talk with many of you if we get a chance. So. Awesome. Thanks for sharing thank you. today. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks. I know that some of you could go like, we want more, and I want to hear more, and I'm there too, but I want to challenge now back to your heart a little bit. So on your chairs, there's some money. Yeah, you're getting free money today. So don't spend it all in one place. But if you want to grab that in green, you should have those there. And if you're online, look under your chair. Who knows? You might find one there. It's weird if you do, though, so I would caution you. But if you want to grab that, and if there's uh, not enough, reach around, find one. I'd love for you to have one of those. If you already have one and you want to take it out of your Bible, do so. But I encourage you to grab that. And if you have a pen, I'd like you to write something on one side. I'd like you to write the word krung on one side. And then on flip it over, I'd like you to write the word brow. And this is an important part of our message today, an important challenge that I want to give you. Take that, keep it in your wallet, keep it in your Bible, use it as a reminder for a small part that family gets, church gets to play in God's big plan. It is an, a huge honor that we get to do this. And one of the things that I want to celebrate is that we feel that it is time for Family Church to expand our reach. As we think about not only reaching into South Campus, South County this month, at the end of the month, launching a whole new campus here in Douglas County, we also want to expand our reach and bring on another people group into our adoption. And so that people group is called the Brow. And now, if you know anything about the Brow, it's like the Brow Krung are very close related. And one of the cool things is, as we've gone over in teams since 2006, we've been committed every two years to go connect with the people, connect with the local church, connect with the missionaries, connect, pray, share life with them. And we've built relationship not only with Krung uh, missionaries, but with Brow missionaries and Brow pastors and Brow translators. And I want to introduce you to one such translator. Her name is Jacqueline Jordy, and I know it's hard to see. I don't have a lot of good pictures of her close up, but she is here, and she's from uh, Swiss, and then these are uh, Cambodian workers who are doing Bible translation. And I've sat in this hut, and we sit, and we watch them translate the Bible, and this is the, the beginning of the work that they're doing. And this work is being fueled and aided 
by this work. And so this is the beginning of the Brow Bible. And the cool thing is that as you look at this and you think, wow, this is like history in the making. The people who will be perhaps 100 years beyond us in this room, Lord willing, they're going to have this completed and there'll be many believers because of the people in this room who are doing this work. And so what we feel is that as we've gone, we've built connection and we got to know Jacqueline. And then about six years ago, we built some more relationship and four years ago, we had some deeper conversations. And this last January, I felt like our team, we really came into this really unique opportunity and we really felt like God was leading us this way as a church. And then we asked her, said, how are you doing, Jacqueline? And she said, oh, I'm good. You know, she works hard. But we asked a question because we really felt God was leading this. He said, how is your finances? How are you doing? Because you're working hard and, and, you know, a single lady going through the jungle in the nasty, rainy weather that they get in these trucks, in the mud, and she goes up into these villages and she serves and she translates. And she says, well, actually, my sending church is potentially going bankrupt. And I'm concerned. We didn't hear from her about this. She didn't come to us knowing that we like to do work in Cambodia that we like to follow God where he was. We pursued, and God opened a door. So we feel led. The board is approved, and the mission team, and we feel it's time, Family Church, to expand our reach in Cambodia. And so I want to bring you on, on board with that. And in January, we'd love to do a new signing. And for those who are new to Family Church, a chance to commit, to say, that Brow People group, we want to see them reached. And we're going to talk more about those in the, in the months to come, in the years to come. But I hope that you're encouraged and thinking about, wow, a a thing that we're doing by praying and by supporting financially and by sending people to go care for missionaries and build relationship is having fruit. Fruit that many of you may never see firsthand, but you need to know that God is at work. And so I come to our last point of today. Why do we go? Because he came. This passage is so powerful in Mark. It says this, And he said to them, Who? Well, that would be Jesus speaking. God in the flesh, who left his heavenly realm and dwelt in this crazy body of Jesus, says, Go into the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Go. And so for that reason, because he came, we go. We begin in a small little town of Sutherland and we say, that's not enough, let's, let's go. And so for some of you, you go to work and you begin to share your life about what God is doing. And we plant a campus in Green and we thank you, Green, that you're there. And, and then as, as we're able to reach Green through some technology too, right, then we go into the internet and we have people online and thank you for watching. I pray you're being challenged. And as we look to launch this campus, see, it's not okay for us to just be comfortable. God says go. And so I'm challenging you today to say, where do you need to go? Is it a neighbor that's been on your heart? Are you part of going to the next campus? Perhaps you're going to go serve in Mexico at the next trip next year, and we'll be talking about that soon. Where's God calling you to? Where is it that you need to go? Maybe some of you are going to go to Cambodia someday. Well, I'm going to release to you, Green. Pastor Will, thanks so much. Uh, Give him a challenge down there, would you? Well, your personal challenge here, Sutherland, is this. The first one, I'm going to ask you to write a name or two. Where do you need to take the gospel? That could be a location. That could be a person. I want you to think for a moment. What if Craig and Jenny said, Jenny, I don't think we should go back there. And Jenny says, I don't want to go back. What if, she, what if they hadn't? God would have still worked. He would have found somebody else. But what if they hadn't gone? And what if we hadn't decided to reach a little further south and plant another campus? Who's there today in Tri-City area that doesn't know Jesus and yet an opportunity is coming. 
So where? Write that down. And the second one I would challenge you to is who? Who will you pray for? Not just the person perhaps you just wrote, but maybe you just haven't been that invested in praying for a missionary. And, you know, we have these out there in the lobby. And if you're in a life group, I challenge you. And all the time I say these cards are ways that you can get to know a specific missionary that Family Church supports. And maybe you have one that you're supporting. That's awesome. But who are you praying for? I love the humility, and I thank you, Craig and Jenny, because every year we we get ready to go, we ask, what would you like? It costs money to go and connect with you. So would you like us to send you the money, or is there a project, or what? And the first thing, and I appreciate, and it's not just them, it's people all over. They say, please pray for us. That is the best gift you can give. And then they always say, please come see us. That is a special time. And so they got to come and hang out with me today, and it's just been cool. And the relationship goes on and on. So I'm going to close in prayer, and uh, I'm going to release. If you're watching online, thanks for joining us today. We're grateful you could be a part of this. Let's pray, everybody. Father God, we thank you, and we, uh, we celebrate today what you are doing. God, we know that you are alive and active, and this is a short glimpse into a powerful story. There is so much happening It would take us, well, I believe it'll take an eternity to tell it all. God, I pray that each one here today is impacted by not only the challenge of where we might go next, but the idea that we can reach another people group if we're committed to serving you, God, that you will bring the workers, and we pray for those, that you will bring the resources. We pray for that and the finances, God. We pray for each person here today that that they leave knowing that they're loved, God knowing that you've given everything to them and that you came specifically to have relationship with us. In your precious and powerful name we pray, amen, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that, and we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.